I'm going to talk today about uh, economic opportunity in America, focusing in particular on this, of course, very unique and exceptional moment we're in uh, in the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and while I'm going to focus predominantly on COVID-19, I want to start by situating our conversation in the broader historical context by talking about the American dream. So the American dream, as you all know, is a multifaceted, complicated concept that can mean different things to different people. But one important aspect of it, in my view, is the idea that America is supposed to be a country where through hard work, anyone should have a chance of rising up in the income distribution and concretely perhaps achieving a higher standard of living than their parents did. And so I wanna start out in this first slide here by looking at whether America in fact lives up to that aspiration. Uh, what we're doing in a study we released a, a couple of years ago is just try to compute the fraction of kids who go on to earn more than their parents did, adjusting for inflation and measuring both kids and parents' incomes in their mid thirties. And we're looking at that data by the year in which the child is born. And so what you can see here is if you look back at kids born in the 1940s and 1950s in America, it was a virtual guarantee for that generation that you were gonna achieve the American dream of moving up relative to your parents. 92% of children born in America in 1940 went on to earn more than their parents did. But if you look at what has happened over time, you see a dramatic fading of the American dream such that for children born in the 1980s who are entering the labor market um, in recent years, uh, now it's basically a 50-50 coin flip as to whether you are gonna do better than your parents. Now this dramatic trend is of course of great interest to economists like myself. It's a fundamental change in the American economy. I would argue it's also of great interest to political scientists like the chancellor, to many of you in the general public, uh, to society at large, because I think this underlies uh, a lot of the frustration that Americans around the country are expressing that the US is no longer a place where it's easy to get ahead, even through hard work. And so motivated by that macroeconomic trend in our research group at Harvard, Opportunity Insights, we are quite focused on the question of what is driving that trend uh, what are the determinants of economic opportunity in America? And how can we potentially reverse the fading of the American dream? And our angle to approaching that large question, which of course many social scientists are interested in and have been interested in over the years, is to use the tools of big data, to use the buzzword that's common now in Silicon Valley, where you hear all the time about private sector companies like Google and Amazon using data to try to improve the products they offer. Analogously, our vision is that maybe such data sources can be used to improve social and economic policy. Now we analyze these questions uh, by looking at a broad range of policies from childhood to adulthood, not necessarily focused on any one domain like education, which you might think of as a key driver of mobility and I do think is important, but also looking at things like affordable housing or social capital or labor markets, a variety of different issues. Now, what I'm going to do today is, within that broader framework, focus in particular on the economic impacts of COVID-19 on economic opportunity, both in the short run, what can we do to uh, come out of this crisis uh, in the US today, and what are the longer term implications relating back to that graph that I started out with for economic mobility and opportunity in America. So just to set, set the stage here, in terms of what I'm gonna discuss on, on COVID-19. In our research group, when this crisis hit, we were focused on longer term issues of economic mobility along the lines of what I was describing earlier. And when the crisis hit, we began to think, you know, how could we, like many others in our position who were interested in contributing in some way to, to the crisis, to recovery from the crisis, what could we do? And one thing that struck us was that uh, there's a real limitation in the data that people have to try to figure out how to respond to the crisis. So most of the data that people use to measure macroeconomic activity are things that you see in newspaper headlines like unemployment rates, GDP growth rates, and so forth. And while those statistics are obviously incredibly important and they're built from surveys of lots of households and businesses across the US, they are limited in a couple of ways. 
first, they don't always give you a very granular picture of what's going on on the ground. So if you're interested in understanding what's happening in, in Tennessee or what's happening in Nashville or in particular neighborhoods or for particular subgroups of people within Nashville, typically sample sizes from existing government surveys are not gonna be large enough to really shed light on that. Second, they're not available at very high frequencies. So if you think about data like GDP, it's released at a quarterly level and that can make it hard, say you're a policymaker trying to figure out what exactly should I do to try to help the economy recover, give loans to small businesses or stimulus checks to households, what impacts are those kinds of policies having? It's very hard to figure that out with coarse data. You don't have adequate feedback often to figure out what various policy changes are doing. And so what we started to think about in collaboration with uh, a large group of folks, including people in the private sector, is whether we could build a new way to track the economy using data from the private sector. So think of companies like credit card processors, uh, payroll, companies that in the modern uh, day have an incredible window into economic activity. Every time you swipe your credit card, effectively companies have a sense of what's going on in terms of spending patterns or business revenue patterns. Likewise, major payroll processors have a sense of employment patterns in a way that's unprecedented relative to the type of information we had in the past. And so we set up agreements with about a dozen companies uh, across America to construct a new economic tracker built using big data that, uh, as I will share with you today, I think can really give us an unprecedented window into economic activity in America and shed some light on what we can do to recover from this crisis from an economic perspective. So before I dive in to show you some analysis of these data, I wanna show you an interactive tool that we built that you can access yourself by going to this website, tracktherecovery.org using data from these various corporate partners, which are listed at the bottom here, companies like Intuit, for example, Paychex, a major payroll processor, Affinity Solutions, which has data on credit card and debit card spending for about 10% of Americans and so forth. Uh, and so just to give you a quick flavor of what type of data is available here, all of this data can be viewed through this data visualization platform and can also be freely downloaded for those who might wanna incorporate this data into downstream analyses. And so I'm just gonna start by showing you uh, what happened to spending patterns in the US day by day based on this credit and debit card data. And what you can see here is spending was kind of hovering around baseline levels prior to the COVID crisis, normalized at zero here. And then right when the national emergency was declared and COVID really hit the US, you can see that spending very rapidly fell by roughly 35% in the United States, so an incredible reduction in consumer spending. And then uh, in April 15th, when the CARES Act was enacted and households started to receive $1,200 stimulus checks, which I'm gonna come back to in more detail in a little bit, uh, you see that the stimulus payments uh, led to some pretty rapid increase in spending. And then there's been some gradual recovery since that point and sort of, a, sort of a stalling since August or so. So this is the national picture. And here you're able to see this data at a much higher frequency day by day than what you'd be able to see based on publicly available statistics. But what I think is really powerful about these data and might be useful for those of you working on these issues in Nashville and in Tennessee is that you can now look at these data uh, area by area. So let me click on Tennessee, for example. Notice that Tennessee has a very different pattern relative to what I was showing you nationally. So in particular, you see this extremely sharp drop in Tennessee, like you saw nationally, but then right when the stimulus checks went out in mid-April, you're basically almost immediately back to baseline levels on average, and then have stayed in terms of total spending in Tennessee, essentially at, at baseline levels. Now contrast that with you know, nearby North Carolina, where you don't see nearly as sharp of an uptick in spending when the stimulus checks went out and you see more of a gradual recovery, but even more recently spending remains well below what you see in Tennessee. Now here I'm looking at the data at a state by state level, just to give you a flavor of uh, what you can do with this and how the heterogeneity I think really emerges even at a finer level. Let's click on counties here. Um, and look at the data by county in Tennessee. And so to give you an example, uh, where many of you are in Nashville, Davidson County, 
uh, you can see that you see the sharp drop off like we saw elsewhere, but you see essentially no recovery when the stimulus checks went out in terms of spending. And even now, spending remains far below baseline levels. So very different from patterns in other parts of the state. So in particular, in the Eastern parts of the state, you see much more rapid recovery in terms of spending. And if you look, you know, even at other nearby counties, like if I click on Dixon, for example, here, you're back at baseline levels of spending or close to that, not quite baseline, uh, relatively quickly. So all of this is just to give you some local examples to show you, I think, when we just look at a national picture, which is typically what economists have tended to do in the past, largely because of data limitations, we haven't had the ability to zoom in this finely. Uh, I think you're missing a tremendous amount of the picture because what the issues are in Tennessee might be very different from what they are in North Carolina. What the issues are in Nashville might be very different from what they are in different parts of the state. And so with that uh, you know, illustration of what is in the data, I now want to turn back to the slide deck and show you some analysis that we've done to try to understand in a more systematic way on average across the US economy, how the COVID crisis has affected economic activity and what lessons we can draw for economic policy going forward. So I'm going to start again by looking at the spending data, but here I'm going to disaggregate it in a different way uh, looking at spending broken down by income quartile. And so what you're seeing here is a dashed line showing you the data as a reference for 2019 day by day. And then the solid line is data shown for 2020. And as we've seen a few times, right in uh, mid-March, there's a sharp drop in spending um, and then a gradual recovery over time. So this orange series here, is being shown for people in the top income quartile, the top 25% of the income distribution. And you can see that folks in the top income quartile started spending about $3 billion per day less, about a 40% reduction when uh, the COVID crisis hit. Uh, and then gradually they've increased spending over time, but you're still, you know, even now uh, in, in more recent data, about a billion dollars down per day. Now, in contrast, if we look at people in the bottom income quartile. We again see a drop when the COVID crisis hits, but it's significantly smaller in magnitude, both in percentage terms and especially in dollar terms. And then you see a more rapid recovery such that by the time you're in June or so, you're essentially back to 2019 levels of spending. So the first key fact that you see from this analysis, and you'll see why this is really crucial in explaining everything that follows, is that the vast majority of the spending reduction that we see in the COVID crisis that is really precipitating, I think, the uh, economic uh, shock in the US is driven by high income households. Households in the top quartile of the income distribution account for more than half of the aggregate spending reduction uh, that we're seeing in the United States. Now, why are households cutting spending so much? One hypothesis you might have traditionally, you know, this is what we would normally think in recessions, is that people are cutting spending uh, because uh, they are concerned about um, their incomes, you know, incomes might have fallen, they're concerned about the fall in the stock market and so forth. So one view is that it's because of financial concerns. A different view, obviously relevant in the midst of a pandemic, is that people are concerned about their health. Maybe people are spending much less because they're just spending less time outside their house, they're self-isolating, uh, and maybe that's what's driving the reduction in spending. So one way you can figure that out is by disaggregating these data and looking at where those spending cuts are coming from. And I'm giving you one illustration here, just showing you a few subcategories. And what you see is a very clear pattern that we see more generally, which is that the vast majority of the reduction in spending is in things that you consume in person that basically require you to go outside your house and put you at some risk of contracting COVID infection. So things like restaurants, airlines, barbers and beauty shops see enormous reductions in spending. By contrast, if you look at things like landscaping services or the installation of at-home swim, swimming pools, which can be done literally while you're inside the house and uh, the service is being provided outside the house, those things, if anything, are actually slightly up relative to baseline. So clearly this points in favor of the view that this is about concerns about health 
rather than concerns about a reduction in income or expected income. Because if it were the latter, you would expect things like the installation of swimming pools or other types of purchases that don't involve contact to fall as well. And so the first key point that, uh, that I want um, you to take away is that I think what COVID initially did to the economy is that it induced a lot of folks, especially high income folks, to decide to spend a lot less, in particular on in-person services, and why high income folks in particular, you know, I think many people are able to work remotely, have the capacity to self-isolate, and that ends up driving down spending a lot. Now, I think a natural way to think about the macro economy is kind of as a set of dominoes that are linked to each other. And so what I've just shown you in that analogy is that the first domino that fell was that consumer spending fell a lot. Now, what impacts does that have on other people in the economy? Well, the next thing that that affects is businesses, right? Of course, if people are spending less, businesses are gonna have less revenue. And here, it turns out to be a really fruitful way to, to look at this data is to disaggregate the business revenue data, looking at the data from the business's perspective, geographically. And so think back to the logic I just laid out that high income folks cut spending on in-person services a lot. Well, where do you tend to spend on in-person services? Where do you tend to go out to eat or get your hair cut? It's usually near where you live. And so the, the consequence of that is that businesses located in the most affluent parts of cities, the highest rent parts of cities, for example, tended to experience the largest revenue losses. So I'll give you an example here from New York City. This is showing you changes in small business revenues by zip code in New York. For those familiar with the geography of New York, this is Central Park. And these neighborhoods here, the Upper East Side of Manhattan, for example, some of the most affluent residential neighborhoods in America, you can see that businesses there lost more than 80, 90% of their revenue when the COVID crisis hit. So remarkable, just you know, really dramatic reductions in business revenue. In contrast, if you go up to the Bronx or go to different parts of the Queens that are less affluent, you see much, much smaller revenue losses, more on the order of 30%. So even within New York City, because of this mechanism of differential changes in spending by income level, you see these very disparate impacts on businesses. Now that is true, uh, true throughout the United States. Here's analogous zip code level data in Nashville. Uh, and you can see that in Nashville, for example, right around the university, really enormous losses in small business revenue, more than 60, 70%. Uh, but in contrast, if you go north of the city to what are some of the less affluent areas, again, you see that exact same pattern of significantly smaller small business revenue losses in those areas, right? So a pattern of impacts that might be surprising, it certainly was surprising to me, usually what we see in downturns is the less affluent areas get hit hardest. In this crisis, it's exactly flipped because uh, the origin, I think, of the shock is coming from health concerns. Okay, uh, so now third step in, these, uh, in the sequence of dominoes falling. So businesses have lost revenue. They've got to do something uh, about that. Uh, and so how do they balance their books? Well, the next thing that happens is it affects worker employment. And so turning to data from payroll providers where we're able to, able to track millions of workers' paychecks and look at employment patterns, uh, we can see again now, I'm just gonna start with a national picture, plotting uh, employment rates by wage quartile. Uh, you can see that uh, right when the crisis hits, uh, there's a significant reduction in employment, but that reduction in employment is sharpest for people in the bottom wage quartile, making less than about $27,000 a year versus people in the top uh, wage quartile. So in the bottom wage quartile, remarkably 36% of people lost their jobs compared with 14% in the top wage quartile. Now, what's I think furthermore uh, remarkable is that you hear a lot this, this term in the media of V-shaped recession. And if you look at what this curve looked like for people at the high end of the income distribution, it does in fact look exactly like a V, right? So within a few weeks for people at the high end of the income distribution, you end up seeing employment levels recover almost to where they were pre-COVID. But for people at the bottom of the income distribution, you see a significant recovery, but then it kind of stalls starting in July 
and you're still 20% below baseline levels even in recent weeks. So why is that? Why is there such a different impact of the recession on people in low wage jobs versus high wage jobs and why do the recovery patterns look very different? So one hypothesis you might have is that this is about differences in the sectors in which people work. So maybe there are more low wage workers in in-person service sectors. Those are the ones that were hit hardest in terms of spending losses. And maybe that's why we're seeing this sustained employment loss for, for those folks. So I think that's part of what's going on. But you know, I think quite worryingly, that does not seem to be all that is going on. And that is illustrated by this chart here, where I'm going to take one specific example. I'm going to look at employment in the retail sector. And what you can see is that if you look at consumer spending in the retail sector, it's actually higher now than it was initially. So total retail spending in America is higher than it was. And how is that happening? People are spending a lot online or at big firms like Walmart online, Amazon online, and so forth. Uh, but if you look at employment patterns for people in the top wage quartile, we see the pattern I talked about before, where they're basically back to pre-COVID levels of employment. But even within the retail sector, where spending is no longer below where it was initially, employment for low wage workers is still 20% below where we were uh, pre-COVID. And so the reason I think this is really alarming is that it is an early signal of what economists sometimes have called a jobless recovery, where this sector sort of looks like it's recovered, yet a lot of low-wage workers haven't gotten their jobs back. So what is going on? I think one potential explanation, and further research is required to, to nail this down, but one possibility is that companies have shifted effectively to using more technology. So think about Amazon versus a local store, which employs a very different mix of workers and has more overseas production effectively and more uh, technological use. And that could end up having detrimental impacts on low wage workers employment prospects going forward in the long run, not just in the short run. And I think this is an early indication that that type of thing could be quite important and is something that's going to be very important to pay attention to uh, uh, across the US. Now, you can look at the data, I've been showing you the national trends. Again, you can look at the data uh, spatially and you see a pattern very consistent with what I was showing you before on the business revenue losses. If you look at where low wage workers have been most likely to lose their jobs, you can see that again, it's low wage workers who are working in the most affluent parts of each city who are most likely to have lost their jobs. So if you look for instance at low wage workers in the bottom wage quartile working in the affluent parts of Manhattan, 70% of them have lost their jobs. Whereas if you look up uh, you know, in the Bronx, it's more like 30% or, or 20%. Uh, and so again, you know, there's there these very starkly different patterns linking back to that initial spending shock uh, that I showed you. Uh, and once again, that pattern plays out within Nashville, it plays out, you know, within Tennessee. I think this is a pretty systematic feature of the data across the United States. Uh, so um, what I want to transition to next is I've shown you essentially a bunch of diagnostic analysis uh, that illustrates how COVID-19 has affected uh, the American economy and the impacts it's had on spending, revenues, and employment. So naturally, I think the question to ask at this point is, okay, what can we do about this? What can we do to reverse this set of dominoes falling? How can we mitigate the economic impacts of COVID-19 uh, and improve employment prospects for low-income workers and so forth? And so the way I'm gonna approach that is to first show you an evaluation of three major sets of policies that state governments and federal governments tried to implement to mitigate the economic impacts of COVID-19, and then use that evaluation as a basis to talk about what we can do going forward, uh, given where we are now. So let me start by talking about one set of policies that received a lot of discussion, state-ordered shutdowns and reopenings. When should we shut down businesses? When should we reopen businesses? And I'm gonna illustrate our findings here by just showing you a very simple case study comparing Colorado and New Mexico, which are interesting states to compare because they both shut down at roughly the same time, but Colorado began reopening its businesses about two weeks before New Mexico did. 
And what we're plotting here are consumer spending patterns in Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, and what you can see is that these two series look basically identical. You can't essentially can't tell them apart. And that turns out to be a generic pattern that we find in the data. If you compare Colorado and New Mexico, or you compare any other st set of states that opened earlier versus later, if you look at spending patterns, business revenue, employment, so forth, you hardly see any difference between states that opened earlier versus later. And what I think is going on is that this is very consistent with the diagnostic story that I was sharing earlier, that the fundamental reason spending fell is not because of constraints imposed by the government. It's because lots of folks, in particular high income folks who have the capacity to self-isolate, chose to self-isolate uh, and start spending a lot less in the face of the health risks. And so there's just a limited ability, I think, of executive orders to restore economic activity. Uh, a second major set of policies, this time at the federal level, stimulus payments. So roughly $1,200 per person, checks issued on exactly April 15th by direct deposit. So the idea here was that we're gonna to try to give people cash that they will hopefully spend, which will then lead to more business revenues and undo some of the employment losses that we saw in the economy. That's how stimulus is supposed to work. So we can use the spending data that we've collected to assess whether the stimulus actually worked. And so the, the way we can do that is plot spending literally day by day around April 15th when these checks were deposited. And you can see you know, quite clearly that exactly on April 15th, when a lot of people got this cash deposited, uh, spending jumped up by 26% exactly on that day relative to April 13th or 14th. So it's, I think, quite evident that the stimulus worked at this level of helping households spend more, and in particular, low-income households. You see a big surge in spending when the stimulus checks were sent out. Um, but there's a caveat to this. If you dig in and ask, where did households start spending more? It turns out that most of the spending increase was in durable goods. So think of things like refrigerators, for example, or appliances, where spending increased by about 20% when these stimulus checks were, went out. By contrast, if you look at in-person spending, that jumped by only about 7% uh, when the stimulus checks were sent out. So why is this important? Usually the way we think that stimulus is supposed to work is that it fills in kind of the holes that were created by the economic shock. So as we saw, a lot of the reduction in spending initially was at local restaurants and shops who lost a lot of revenue and had to lay off many workers. But when the stimulus checks were sent out, people started to spend more, but not at the local shops and restaurants. They started to spend more on Amazon, for example. And so that is potentially problematic in terms of restoring employment because the money is not going back to the businesses that laid off the workers. And so in fact, it turns out, even if you look at a state like Tennessee, where spending, as I showed you, on average, has gotten back pretty close to baseline levels, if you were to look at employment levels in Tennessee, you would see that they are still 20% below baseline, in particular for low-wage workers. And I think that's because you don't have the spending going exactly back to where uh, the problems initially emerged. And so there's a limited capacity then for stimulus to basically undo the damage done by COVID. The third uh, and last policy that I want to talk about here um, is the Paycheck Protection Program, which many of you might know was another important aspect of the CARES Act. It was about $500 or $600 billion of loans to small businesses, the idea there being uh, that we'd give small businesses financial assistance, forgivable loans, if they maintained payroll at sufficiently high levels as another way to try to sustain employment in the crisis. And so we can again use these new data to evaluate the effectiveness of the Paycheck Protection Program, exploiting the fact that these loans were available to firms that had fewer than 500 employees. They were not available, generally speaking, to firms with more than 500 employees. And so what we can do is basically plot trends in employment for firms that had more than 500 employees in the orange. Think of that as like a control group and firms in the turquoise green that had fewer than 500 employees and were eligible for the program. And you can see that when the Paycheck Protection Program begins on April 3rd, you do start to see a little bit of an increase in employment in the smaller firms relative 
to the larger firms. Uh, however, the magnitude of that impact is pretty small. It's about a two percentage point difference. And in particular, it comes nowhere close to closing the enormous reduction in employment that occurred when the COVID shock hit. And this two percentage point increase in employment, if you think about how much we spent on the program, about $500 billion, it means that in effect, we spent about $300,000 per job that was saved through the Paycheck Protection Program. Now you might ask, how is that possible? How did we end up spending so much money yet not save that many jobs given that so many firms took up these loans? Well, I think the intuitive way to think about it is there were lots of firms that took up the Paycheck Protection Program who were not gonna lay off any workers anyway. So think about, for instance, a small law firm uh, was able to provide uh, services remotely, was not gonna lay off that many workers to begin with, uh, but why not sign up for the Paycheck Protection Program? It's free money from the government. And so what ends up happening then is you have relatively small marginal impacts on employment despite an enormous total expenditure. And so unfortunately, I think again, this is an example where the traditional economic tools that we would think of in sort of a normal recession, providing liquidity to firms, uh, doesn't end up being that effective uh, perhaps in the midst of a pandemic. So what I wanna do uh, in the last few minutes is wrap up here by connecting these short run impacts that I've been showing you. It's very natural, of course, in a time of crisis to concentrate on how we get back in terms of employment and spending and so forth, back to where we were just a few months ago. I wanna now loop back though, to also get back to the longer term picture of economic opportunity, which we've been focused on in our group and think about what this means for America more broadly uh, in the long run. Uh, before then uh, turning it over uh, to, to discussion and, and questions. So to think about long-term economic opportunity, I wanna first show you a snapshot of some other data that we've been tracking in the context of the COVID crisis, which is measuring educational progress by income group. So here, what we're doing is using data from a platform called Zern, which is a platform that about a million students in the US use to learn math as part of their elementary school curriculum. And uh, what we're doing here is tracking the number of math lessons that students complete on the Zern platform uh, around the time the COVID crisis hit and schools went to remote instruction. And we're doing that separately for kids and families in the top income quartile versus the bottom income quartile. And what you can see is I think a very disheartening pattern, which is that for high income kids, there was some reduction in the amount of math that they were learning, but then a pretty uh, quick reversion back to where they were before. But for low income kids, there's a 60% reduction in the amount of math that they're learning when the crisis hits. So like a remarkable reduction. And the reason I think this is so important is because it illustrates that this short term temporary shock coming back to the ideas I started out with on economic opportunity um, more, uh, more broadly, um, uh, you know, I think it, it shows that there could be a scarring effect uh, of this recession where we continue to see uh, impacts, you know, many years down the road as kids are learning less early on in school. Uh, and so, you know, I've been focusing here primarily on disparities by income, but naturally given the connection between income and factors like race and ethnicity in the United States, a lot of these disparities that I'm showing you here also play out on those dimensions. So if you look then, uh, you know, in this case at employment losses for white Americans versus black Americans or mortality rates for white Americans versus black Americans, again, you see these disparate impacts by race and ethnicity uh, that mirror a lot of the patterns that I've been showing you uh, by income. And so, you know, what I think when you lo look at this data from a longer term perspective, you see is that these short term impacts of the crisis might exacerbate some of the underlying disparities that we already had in the US economy and connect to, you know, what is the, I think, other major crisis that people have been focused on in the US, the racial inequity crisis. Um, there are tight links between these things. And in fact, they might be exacerbated uh, in the context of COVID. So the final point I wanna make is when we think about these types of disparities by race uh, and ethnicity or by income group, I think a lot of these disparities, it's very important to remember, 
are not just emerging from things that are happening right now with COVID, but rather deeper structural factors that have existed in the US for a very long time. And so I just wanna show you a couple of final results from some of our earlier work on economic opportunity, which illustrates what some, some of those structural factors are. And so starting first with the disparities by race and ethnicity, I wanna to turn to this chart here, uh, which shows you patterns of income mobility for black versus white men raised in high income families. So the way this chart is constructed is that we take uh, data on about 20 million kids and look at kids who grew up in high income families here, families in the top fifth of the income distribution. And we look at where those kids themselves end up as adults. Do they end up in the bottom fifth, the second fifth, or do they stay in the top fifth? The purple dots here are for black men and the green dots are for white men. And what you see in this picture, I think is a heartbreaking fact about America, which is for white men, if you're born into a high income family, you have pretty good odds of remaining in the upper middle class. You can see the green dots kind of float and stay towards the top. Whereas if you look at the purple dots, you see this cascading pattern of coming down towards the bottom, such that if you're a black man, even a black man who grew up in an affluent family, you are equally likely to end up in the lower middle class as you are to remain affluent yourself. And so one way to think about it visually is, uh, if you think of achieving the American dream as climbing an income ladder for white Americans, for black Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill where even after you've reached up in one generation, you have a very high propensity to fall back down due to various structural factors in the next generation. And it's this kind of treadmill that I think leads to the types of disparities that you read a lot about in the media in the context of the COVID crisis. It's the underlying problem in economic opportunity by race that is leading to the disparities that we see in each of the crises uh, that then occur and that are exacerbated in the current crisis. So last point, uh, I think a lot of these uh, disparities that we're seeing um, by race, by ethnicity on other dimensions, they emerge again to echo a theme I've emphasized in this talk, not at a broad national level, but at a very local level. And so if you look at data within Nashville, and look at children's chances of upward mobility. So what we're plotting here uh, in particular is using information from anonymized tax returns and census data. What is the average income in adulthood of kids who grew up in low-income families by the census tract in which they grew up? Red colors are areas where kids go on to achieve lower levels of income in adulthood. Blue colors are areas where kids go on to achieve higher levels of income you can see that there's an incredible spectrum in terms of outcomes for kids uh, growing up in certain parts of Nashville in the center here versus the, the more uh, outlying areas, particularly in the Southwest parts of the city. Um, and through an extensive body of research looking at this type of data, we have found that if you look at kids who move from these red colored areas to the blue green colored parts of the map, you see dramatically improved outcomes for them in adulthood. And so again, if you then start to dig in and ask, you know, what is it that's driving these differences in economic opportunity across areas, you find that there are a variety of systematic factors about neighborhoods that are leading to these structural differences, or at least associated with them, things like concentration of poverty, the availability of social capital in an area, perhaps not surprisingly, the quality of schools in an area. And I think it's these longer term structural factors that are also connected to the disparities that we're seeing in the COVID crisis. So let me conclude by just saying a word about uh, policy implications. I think there are three main takeaways that I would take from all the, the data that I've uh, shown you here. First, I think public health efforts are really the key to economic recovery at a broad level. If you can't get people to be confident enough to go out and spend, you're not gonna fundamentally undo the economic damage that's been done. In the meantime, I think economic policy can focus on the social safety net uh, quite fruitfully, not trying to restart the economy, but rather support the many people, in particular low-wage workers, who've lost their jobs through no fault of their own. So things like unemployment insurance programs and so forth. And then I think it's very important in a crisis like this to not lose sight of the longer-term challenges and economic opportunity that we face in the US, 
address address the core structural factors, disparities across neighborhoods, across race and ethnicity that limit economic opportunity for many Americans. So let me end there and uh, thank you all. I look forward to your questions. And let me just note that all of the data that I've been showing you here is publicly available online on these websites. And you're also very welcome to email our team. We're happy to be of assistance. Thanks very much. Thank you, Raj. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, I'm Kit Carpenter. I'm a professor of economics, um, and I will be leading off our Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, we have some pre-submitted questions, and we have a Q&A feature here in the Zoom. So if you have questions, please continue to put those in and keep them coming. Uh, we wanted to start off the Q&A with a couple of data science, um, data-related questions, uh, given the nature of our co-sponsorship with the Data Science Institute. Um, and one comes from the Data Science Institute Chief Data Scientist, Jesse Spencer Smith, who asks, uh, using those real time indicators, which seem to indicate that the in person services for the wealthy dropped more than in other areas. It's, is it possible to determine if mask mandates uh, mitigates the economic impact? Uh, if that's the case, could one estimate the economic value of mask use on the economy? Yeah, uh, th that's a great question. Thank you for that. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that we've seen with these data is because we've made it all publicly available, there are other folks who have done that type of analysis that you just described. So we have not looked at mask mandates ourselves, but you can download the data and link it to data on mask mandates and ask what has happened. And people, as you intuited, have started to find effects exactly like this, where mask mandates, you know, we already know from public health literature can reduce the spread of the COVID infection. And I think there is some evidence also can lead to uh, more spending and potentially thereby provide a path to uh, creating economic recovery. So uh, I think that's exactly the type of analysis that one can uh, do with these data. And I, th I think that makes sense. Great, thank you. Um, another question about uh, potential biases that might come from the data. So uh, people are concerned about uh, the credit card data and its representativeness. So if low income folks are more likely to use, not use credit cards or be unbanked, for example, um, how would that affect things? Paychecks, for example, maybe poor folks are more likely to be paid under the table. Maybe are we you know, dramatically potentially underestimating the amount of inequality? Yeah. yeah, great question. As you can imagine, we spent a ton of time uh, trying to think about that question ourselves, the, the first step in using a new data source like this is to assess its representativeness and reliability. So let me say a couple things on how we tried to address that issue. So the first thing we do, if you look at the paper, the academic paper that's posted online along with this tracker, for those who are interested, there's a lot more information. We spend a lot of time benchmarking these new series against publicly available government statistics constructed from representative surveys. So the same surveys that are used to construct the statistics that we all rely upon, GDP, unemployment rates, and so forth, we basically asked, are we tracking things like what's called the monthly retail trade survey that's used to construct GDP? Is the credit card spending data matching those patterns well? And what we found is they are very well correlated. So as a first pass, that I think is quite reassuring, uh, that sort of benchmarking exercise. But then second, you know, you might still worry that when we go to particular subgroups or subsectors like low income folks who might be unbanked, maybe you're getting a misrepresentative picture there. But again, I think in the modern era, if you think about it hard enough, often you can measure lots of things. So let me give you one example in that context. We use data from a company called CoinOut, which gives consumers rewards for scanning their receipts. You essentially get coupons. And so you can use that as a way to construct a series of cash spending off of those receipts that people have scanned. And it turns out you have this data for million some people, the cash spending series that we're able to construct, we show this in the paper, very closely tracks the credit card spending data. So that actually turns out to be not a significant source of bias. So you might've thought, oh, there's no way we're gonna be able to track cash spending, but it's an example of how I think in this time through big data, through data science, we can try to measure a lot of these, these things. It's not that any one measure is perfect, but by triangulating lots of things, I think we can get there. Great, and then one more data question and then I'll hand it off to um, Laura. Um, somebody wants to know what additional data not currently included in Opportunity Insights would be most useful in your opinion in addressing the questions you're interested in. Interested in. So another way to think about that is what's missing? Uh, what types of companies say no to you when you, when you ask them? Yeah, um, so, there, there are a few key things. So one, you'll notice that I didn't show a lot of any data on savings or wealth. That's gonna be very important as you think about 
people's asset positions as the crisis continues. So think about the expiration of unemployment benefits, for example. Well, right now, we haven't seen an enormous crash in consumer spending yet. But at some point, if people are not getting paychecks, uh, eventually they're going to have to run out of money. Our sense is and there's some very nice other work being done by folks using confidential data, JP Morgan Chase, showing this. Uh, people are drawing down their checking account balances and wealth levels are falling. And so being able to track that publicly, I think, would be enormously valuable. And so we're in conversations with banks about whether we might be able to construct that type of data. There are also big sectors <clears throat> that are not captured in credit cards. So think about things like health spending or uh, housing, which you know, you're not going to typically pay your mortgage with a, with a credit card. Uh, and so things like that, uh, I think, are very important to measure. And so, Kit, you know, kind of a broader answer to that question is we are now starting to work with the major statistical agencies of the U.S. to try to expand upon this prototype that we've built here to figure out how you can do this in a more systematic, sustainable way, kind of create a collaboration between the major private sector companies in America and the government so that it's not that we're just trying to, like, throw together this tracker the next time we have a, a crisis. No, let's just have a system of national accounts such that we can measure a bunch of different things that are very important just systematically so that the next time there's a hurricane or another recession or a local shock, we have this kind of data on hand to, to measure what's going on. Great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. So uh, one of the things, I'm Laura Berlin, the executive director at the Sycamore Institute here in Tennessee. And one of the things that we really appreciate about your work is how it connects the dots, right? It's, it's silo busting. And that's something that we talk a lot about at Sycamore. Um, and we mentioned at the beginning of the hour that the, the audience here is very diverse by sector, by geography. And the challenges that they are working every day often get framed as urban or rural health or an economic issue, one that requires a centralized response or a decentralized response. What is your approach to thinking through policy responses in a way that cuts across those kinds of tensions? Yeah, that's, I mean, I think a great uh, challenge in this era, and I, I completely agree with the spirit of the question, first of all, that I think in order to have the best solutions, we can't think from a purely disciplinary perspective that I'm only going to think about the economic issues and have no uh, concern or understanding of the public health concerns in this context or the sociological concerns that matter, I think, for economic opportunity in the longer run. And so I think our approach or my personal approach, let me speak to that first, is just to try to come at the question first from what's the right way to think about this question globally rather than focusing on one particular set of tools. So as an economist, I'm more trained to think about things like incentives and prices and things like that, all of which I think can be very important. But I also try to collaborate with people in sociology or talk with folks in public health in the current context to have a sense of what those issues are. And I think the power, and I appreciate your saying, Laura, that you know our work tries to cut across some of these silos. I think a lot of that comes from transparent analysis of modern data. One of the benefits of big data that I hadn't appreciated necessarily when I started to do this type of work is it allows you to just very transparently communicate about lots of issues with folks in different disciplines and also with the general public, right? So rather than using a complex statistical model where it can be difficult to show exactly what's going on, hopefully in the presentation that I just gave, it was just very transparent to just see with maps and with graphs what is happening without having a complex understanding of statistics. And I have found that that can be incredibly useful in reaching across disciplines and getting people to work together on a problem. Yeah, we often talk about this being an all hands on deck affair, right? We were really pleased that the audience was business sector, nonprofit and government. So I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I have a question from my colleague, Mario Criccini, uh, an economist who asks, Given that recessions impact locations asymmetrically with respect to timing and severity, shouldn't fiscal policy be targeted to zip codes or counties that are most impacted as theories of fiscal risk sharing would imply? And to what degree is this true of the recent stimulus? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. I, I totally agree with the observation. So I, I have a former student of mine, Danny Yagan, who's now a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, who's written a very nice paper First, just documenting the importance of spatial heterogeneity. So if you go back to the Great Recession, look at the experience there, 
the places that were hit hardest, places like Phoenix, for example, even 10 years later, he shows, are recovering from the crisis and have lower levels of employment. So in canonical economic models where we don't think a lot about frictions that prevent people from adjusting, and the simple economic model is if there's a job in a different place or a different sector, I'm gonna go get it. And it doesn't really matter, like I don't need to bother targeting fiscal support to a particular area or to a particular uh, sector. What we're starting to learn is that is really far from true. You see a lot of hysteresis, you see a lot of persistence of these kind of shocks. And so I do think it can make a lot of sense to have targeted fiscal response based on area level factors. Now, some of that's just gonna happen automatically based on individual targeting, right? So if I give unemployment benefits, you're naturally gonna get more money flowing to places with a lot of unemployed people. But I think it can make sense to have an even additional kick beyond that, because when there's a glut of workers in a particular area, all competing for a limited set of jobs, uh, that can further prevent people, you know, they're essentially competing with each other for a scarce set of jobs that can create further problems. And so I think in addition to fiscal stimulus, thinking about things like sectoral job training programs. So I think, you know, there's sort of an opportunity here, right? Where lots of people are displaced. They don't have work to do right now. Can we take a longer run perspective and give people the skills they need, not just to get back to where they were, but maybe even climb up the income ladder further? Uh, I think that kind of thinking, targeting those kinds of programs where there's now some good evidence that can be quite effective to these types of areas can, can be very valuable. Yeah, I'm going to jump next to uh, kind of neighborhood level uh, data again. And a question came in from uh, one of our uh, local leaders who works in housing, saying the research on neighborhood correlation to greater opportunity and outcomes is compelling. At the same time, in most instances, those uh, there is a strong correlation between opportunity neighborhoods and majority white neighborhoods. How does the research address this issue and how do you see the increased attention to issues of systemic discrimination affecting the next steps in the work? Yeah, so thank you for highlighting that. I mean, I, uh, I agree that there's a strong correlation, you know, unfortunately at present in the US between the racial composition of a neighborhood and the rates of upward mobility that we're seeing. Let me speak a bit about a project we've done in Seattle that tries to give more families access to high opportunity neighborhoods. So what we did here is uh, ran a randomized trial with families applying for housing vouchers, about a thousand families, half of whom were black, half of whom were white. Turned out that happened to be the racial makeup of the people applying for housing vouchers. Uh, and what we noticed in the data is that in the past, even the families receiving housing vouchers, this is about, $1,500 a month of rental assistance from the government, the housing choice, or what used to be called the Section 8 voucher program. We spend about $20 billion a year in the US on this. The majority of households, something like 80% of them, even after getting the voucher, lived in a pretty low opportunity area based on our uh, data, the type of data I showed you for Nashville. And so we asked, why is that? Is it that maybe these families don't want to move to the higher opportunity neighborhoods because it's further away from their jobs or because you know, the racial composition is very different and they feel uncomfortable. There are lots of good reasons you might not wanna move as the question is getting at. Or is it that there are other barriers that are preventing families from moving to higher opportunity areas? For instance, landlords may not want to rent to them. Or maybe it's very hard to figure out how to clean up your credit history and find a, the right apartment in a different neighborhood that's further away and so forth. And so we basically set up a service that a local nonprofit provided, which cost about $2,000 per family. So that might seem like a significant sum, but relative to the average cost of a housing voucher, which is about $100,000 over the 10 years that the family is getting that voucher support, it's about a 2% increase in costs. So we, the, we, we provide a set of services that are assistance in the search process, helping to talk with landlords, recruit landlords and so forth. And what we found is that families that received these additional services, something like 60% of them ended up moving to high opportunity areas compared with only 15% in the control group that didn't receive those services. And so the reason I say all that in answer to that question, Laura, is that even among black families, we found that many of those families moved to higher opportunity neighborhoods. 
and we're much happier in the high opportunity neighborhoods and we're happy to stay there. So we are able to achieve some meaningful integration. Now, that being said, I'm of course still not happy about the fact that the only way you can get opportunity is by moving to a neighborhood that's predominantly white as a black family. So I think a deeper question is how do you bring opportunity to neighborhoods that are predominantly black? That are how do you increase opportunity in areas that currently offer less opportunity? That's a, a core question that we are studying in our research group at the moment. Uh, our colleague here in the Department of Teaching and Learning, Rogers Hall, asks, is it possible to use household mobility data to associate exposure to COVID with spatial distributions of educational access and quality? Are risks of household infection related to the geography of learning opportunities? Yeah, so we have not looked at that uh, issue directly ourselves. But again, with, you know, with these kind of publicly available data and you know, the mobility data, where households are spending time is another data set that other folks have compiled, Google and so forth, and we've made that accessible through our website as well. You could certainly ask uh, whether access to opportunities is what's driving some of the mobility patterns we're seeing in spread of COVID infection. What that question makes me think of, which I think is a related point, is that especially for essential workers and low wage workers, you might end up, if we don't have adequate social safety net provisions, um, I think you can put families in a very difficult position where they basically have to choose between their health and putting food on the table, right? And if you don't have unemployment benefits, you need to take that job, even if you're maybe not feeling well. Uh, and that, uh, of course, potentially exacerbates the social problem by uh, potentially spreading COVID infection further. So I think these are issues that would also be very interesting to study uh, with these data. And I think that mechanism is extremely plausible. So going back to how COVID has affected intergenerational mobility, what other sort of policy ideas are you wrestling with that might mitigate the effects um, and, and something we could actually do within the next couple of years? Yeah. Um, so I'll say a few things. I mean, any crisis, as people sometimes like to say, you know, shouldn't be wasted in terms of uh, creating potential opportunities to fundamentally change things. Uh, and so I think you can look at this both from the short term perspective of how do I, for instance, mitigate the big disparities in math learning that I was showing you. So how might you think about that, you know, uh, think about schools in less affluent areas, what are the impediments to learning in those areas, you can look at the data in neighborhood county by county in Tennessee, and see where educational progress is falling and ask, you know, is it about broadband access or about support in schools, or can we target our efforts to the schools where we're seeing the biggest shortfalls? I think that can be incredibly productive in the short run. I also think, as I mentioned earlier, I'll just say it again, uh, for workers who are displaced, you could imagine tying unemployment benefits to job training programs. In particular, there's a program called Gear Up uh, that has been shown to be incredibly effective in randomized trials, incre increasing earnings, for workers who receive one year of mentoring and pairing with employers uh, by increasing earnings by something like 30 or 40% down the road. I think those programs well targeted at the present time when people have a lot of time can be, can be very effective. But then much more broadly, I think this is a moment where lots of Americans are recognizing that there are huge disparities and opportunities that have been made salient by this crisis because of the color of your skin, because of where you happen to live. And I think there are things that we can do in terms of tackling segregation, in terms of providing better access to higher education, and not just access to any higher education, but access to an institution of higher education that actually provides pathways to upward mobility. Again, based on data that you can look at publicly available that we and others have constructed. So that's the longer term perspective that I would take here. Well, and if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that there is certainly a role, not just for state government, but local government and other local institutions to help bring around those changes. That's exactly right. I mean, to me, the encouraging message that I see in these data, while you might see a lot that feels kind of disheartening here, the encouraging message that I see is often within a given city, you can look two or three miles down the road and see much better outcomes 
And that shows you that the problem is tractable at a very local level. You know, the folks on this call, I think, can actually make a difference uh, in, their, in their own neighborhoods, in their own communities, which to me makes the problem much more manageable than the staggering thing you saw initially, you know, from 1940 to today, America has fundamentally changed. I think when we can break down social problems to these smaller units, we can potentially all make a, a bigger difference. Uh, Raj, you've been giving versions of this um, great talk for long, uh, a while now since the pandemic has gone on and on. And I'm wondering um, how has your advice to policy, has your advice to policymakers changed uh, over the course of the pandemic? And if so, how? Yeah, I think initially, I mean, like others, I had no idea how long this would last. And there was a hope that you could, with relatively short-term benefits, kind of sustain people until you get back to normal. I think given where we are now, there obviously this looks like it's it has been and will be with us for quite a while. And so that makes you think about different types of solutions. But I think Kit, probably the piece of data that has changed my views the most is the chart that I showed that even when spending recovers in certain places, in certain sectors, you still see enormous employment losses. So the patterns don't look symmetric on the way down it looked like wherever spending fell more, low wage workers got hit harder. And so then the natural intuition like I had at that point is this is just going to reverse symmetrically. Like as spending comes back up, everything's going to recover. But that clearly doesn't look like it's happening. And I think that then makes you think about, OK, now we're going to have this enormous set of unemployed workers even after people are basically spending what, what they were initially. So now what do we do? Um, and I think that then makes you think a lot more about these retraining programs, longer term assistance. What does this mean for the US economy in, in the long run? So you talked about how businesses are possibly relying more on technology. Um, and what pieces of data are you going to be watching to see how tech evolution impacts the rebound in jobs? Yeah, great, uh, great question. Uh, you know, I think that's a difficult thing to measure because you sort of have to get inside companies and understand how companies are doing production. Uh, and so I view that as a very interesting thing to try to figure out. David Otter at MIT, for instance, who's been doing a lot of work on technological change and job polarization has constructed interesting measures of, of these kinds of things. I also think some of these shifts might be a bit more subtle. So it may not be, you know, the simplest thing to think of is I now use a robot or a computer to do what a person was doing before. So that clearly could be some of what's going on. But I also think some of what's going on in um, these kinds of changes is just finding greater efficiencies. So you previously might have, have had a staff where times were good, there wasn't a tremendous need to be very lean and it's very hard to downsize your workforce normally. And so there wasn't a lot of pressure to do that. In a recession, you've got to find every efficiency you can to stay in business. And so you end up becoming more efficient. Now, when things rebound, obviously there's no strong interest in then becoming more inefficient again. And so companies kind of become more productive. This is a pattern that we see in prior recessions, even if it doesn't mean substituting to more machines you know, you might have found that you didn't quite need the extra staff member to do something and then that ends up affecting uh, employment demand. And so I think that's also gonna be an important aspect to track. So there's not, you know, specific data that you'd be looking to to really answer that question that's company specific and-, and... Yeah, I think one would wanna get company specific data to really measure that accurately, yeah. All right, well, and we're coming into our, the end of our time. Uh, so one final question, um, you know, we are really grateful for your work and your team's commitment to translating research into policy and then into durable change. So take us out on a, on a hopeful note. Um, what issues should we be tackling? What conversations should we be having to create greater opportunity for Tennessee and Tennesseans and, and, and people you know, all across our state? Yeah, I mean, as I was saying earlier, I think there's a lot to be hopeful about in these data. And th the way I look at it is when you see a lot of variation and a lot of change, on the one hand, you can look at that from a disappointed perspective. Isn't it terrible that there are 
There's a lack of opportunity in so many parts of America and lots of people are losing their jobs and it's hard to get ahead. But then you can look at it in the opposite way that, you know, as I was saying, within um, uh, Nashville, within any city in America, you can find affordable neighborhoods where kids have great outcomes, lots of kids go on to great colleges, do very well and so forth. And so looking at those beacons and thinking about how we can emulate that, I think essentially provides us potentially a, a template uh, to move forward in a constructive way. And so my main takeaway from all this is there is some science to economic opportunity. And I think we're getting closer and closer now to having the tools to figure out what that science actually is. And I think much like how in medicine on the health side, medical advance has obviously tremendously improved our lives. On the social side, I think we've made a tremendous number of advances over the past 50 years. And I think we're at a point in terms of economic research and policy where we're gonna be able to do even so much more in the years to come. And I think the interest of the many folks who've joined us today in these issues shows that uh, there's tremendous potential going forward. Well, we have a lot of hope in the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. On behalf of Chancellor Deermeyer, uh, Vanderbilt University, and all of our local co-sponsors, the Sycamore Institute, the Data Science Institute, the Program in Public Policy Studies, and the Department of Economics, I want to thank Dr. Raj Chetty for this excellent talk and discussion, and thank all of you for joining us today, and we hope to see you at a future event. Thanks so much. Thank you.